Thank you for being with us here today. We are going to be studying Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to, uh, through chapter 5, verses 11. And uh, we are uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity. We can come and we can worship you through studying your word. Help us, Lord, to understand it and understand the importance of doing things for the right reasons. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be still continuing talking about Luke. And Luke is going to be talking about uh, sharing love with other people in a little different twist today. Luke provided us in the scripture several looks inside the early church's life. Help us realize, you know, uh, 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 that what he was showing, he showed the good and the bad. He didn't just show the good things, but he showed some bad things. We know the first time he talked about the church, he, he spoke about uh, uh, right after the Holy Spirit had come and they added 3,000 souls after Peter's sermon. And um, it said that the church shared everything was in common. I mean, it said everything was in common. Um, they sold their possessions, and nobody had any needs that weren't met. Well, now again, in chapter 4, chapter four and 5, we're seeing that it's come again, that we're having another uh, uh, a glimpse inside the church, and this occurred shortly after the lame man was healed. 5,000 men were added. The apostles were arrested and then released. And the church prayed for God to give them boldness and to remain faithful amidst all this persecution. Everything seemed to be perfect. But as we know, the only perfect church is the church that I don't go to. Isn't that, isn't that the way it is? The only perfect church is the church you don't go to because once you go to that church, it's no longer perfect because we're not perfect. So there's no way you're going to find a perfect church. I have learned that through hard knocks myself over years. And um, is Branch Chapel Church I go to today perfect? No, it's not. But it's my church, and I do appreciate and love the people that are there. I love all the churches that I have attended in the past. I still consider those people my family and my friends. And uh, because I consider, even churches I go visit, as I go in, out there speaking, on occasion I've spoken at a number of churches, I appreciate them and they're part of my family too. See, we as Christians are all part of the same family. And as we talked about last week's lesson, we need to have a love for the brethren. If you don't love other fellow Christians, regardless which church they might attend, then you have a problem. So anyway, I digress off of that. But everything seemed to be perfect, and so Luke shows us some of the messy parts of the church. You know, this is the warts and all view. So Luke shows us now through these examples of these things that he's not exaggerating when he talks about the goodness of the church because he's willing to show you the not-so-pretty views of the church. Um. You know, Luke shows us both the miraculous transformation and the messiness that remains in God's church because of people have sinned. The church is full of sinners. I've also heard people say, I don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, praise God, where else would they be? I mean, you know, uh, uh, hypocrites are sinners and they need to go to church. <laughs> you know, the same is true of anybody. We should not we should not, not, double negative, ever allow people that are sinners not to come to our church. There's a difference between having them become members of the church and attending the church. You know, if we have a drunkard who's an active drunkard, would you want him to come to the church? Of course you do. Uh, you know, uh, we're all sinners, and we need to hear the gospel. It's a bringing the lost into the church, but anyway... The, the uh, Luke wanted us to see that the church still had sin in the church and that even among the professing church. And so he shows us, though, that, that there is judgment to sin. That even though you're a member of the church, don't think you can join the church and get away with sin. That's not going to happen. If you have sin in your life, God will deal with it. If the church has sin in the church, folks, listen to me on that. If your church participates in sin, in other words, you're doing things and supporting things that are not according to this holy word, 
then God is going to judge your church. He is going to judge it and judge it hard. I'm going to tell you that. Because he does not. We'll see today. God judged this individual because of their sin, even though they were members of the church. Um, so we see the. this is an example that God wants to give us an example uh, that serves as a warning about idolatry. You know, we may not deal with uh, 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 statues that we bow down and worship, but we have lots of idols in our society today. Sports heroes, people go out and buy shoes by somebody that's a sports star. Like, the shoes is what made the sports star a sports star. But it's interesting that the, the guy didn't get the shoe deal until after he became a sports star. So clearly the shoes had nothing to do with him being a sports star. We buy shirts with logos on them because the sports athletes wear these shirts. We, uh, uh, we, we dress like some of our favorite song singers. You know, we, we do that. We, we uh, uh, um, anyway, the, the list goes on and on. The point is, we have idols. Some people's idols are also money. You understand? They're willing to sacrifice their family and their friends and their church and everything else for money. Some people have the, the idolatry, the idol of pleasure. How do I mean that? Every Sunday morning, Sunday evening, you're gone somewhere on the weekends. You're out there celebrating pleasure. You're going to the, the throne of pleasure. Now, we live in a COVID time today, and therefore a lot of us not attending church in person. That's a different story. It doesn't matter where you're at. You're servicing, you're missing church. I understand that. But the Bible tells us to not forsake the assembly of yourselves together as a matter of some is. So come together with the church as best you can. Now, again, COVID is going rampant still. We know that. If you feel safer at home, stay at home. But I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, that people that are spending their time in pleasure instead of spending their time serving God. That is still idolatry. John Calvin described our hearts as idol factories. We criticize, you know, the Israelis because they built this golden calf while we manufacture idols ourselves. You know, these idols may not be always tangible things, but they are just the same idols. So, the next significant issue that's going to occur after this passage now is going to concern wealth and possessions. You know, the widows were complaining about not being treated equally, and therefore the apostles had to create the office of a deacon to be able to wash tables. You know, a deacon's job is to serve the church, not the other way around. You know, deacons are servants, not they're not in charge. They are leaders because they lead you by helping you accomplish what you need to do. So you need to pray for your deacons and your pastors. But remember, the body of the church is in charge. That's why we have business meetings. You have recommendations in the business meetings and people are in charge of the church. Uh, your deacons are servants and they were created as a result of a wealth and possessions dispute. You know, not everybody uh, idolizes wealth and possessions. Some people, money and possessions mean very little. Uh, we see that in some of the lives of our great uh, Christian warriors who had nothing. They died, had nothing. But they had great wealth beyond our imagination. The point is, whether wealth or worldly possessions are involved, temptation and sin are always close by. You know, for some, recognition, respect, status, reputation can even be big idols, bigger idols. 1 Timothy 6, 9-11 through says, But they which will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, 
and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. See, those things are the valuable things. Money is just something that passes by. When you die, you know, I have an extra neighbor who passed on, and I look at all the possessions that he has over there in his yard, and you know what? They're going to belong to somebody else. So all the stuff he worked for doesn't matter. He didn't take it with him. By the way, he was a godly man. He was involved in Alcoholic Anonymous, former, had fought, had fought and defeated that demon many years in his life. And, uh, you know, I, I have great respect. I have a number of good conversations with him. I'm confident that his soul is in the presence of Jesus today. And that's something I can look and be proud of, and you know, be glad of, and rejoice over his graduation. Anyway, these idols are often much more dangerous uh, because they're veiled or hidden. We need the Holy Spirit to reveal them to us through God's Word. Here's one of the times that Luke is going to take us into this realm. This breakaway shows us two sides, two contrasts. We see gospel-shaped economy of people giving selfishness for sakes of others. And then we see satanic counterfeit of the economy that shows the same on the outside, but different on the inside. You know, one gave because they had a desire to give. The other gave because they had a desire to be seen. So now let's look at, at Acts chapter 4, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, and one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which they possessed was his own, but they had all things common. See, the early church congregation was so much centered on being Christ-like, just as we talked about last week, they were willing to lay down their lives, their wants, and their desires for their brethren. They had possessions, if they had possessions that they could help somebody else with, they gave it even when it hurt themselves, even if it meant they went without. Um, some would have you believe, by the way, that this verse supports socialism or communism. You know, and in its purest sense, socialism could be referred to, you know, seeing that you share things in common, uh, no matter what the cost. However, and by the way, communism is simply that the government owns everything, and therefore they own you. Socialism means everybody uh, shares everything, whether it's yours or not. The problem is that neither one of these uh, political systems uh, are what's referred to here. Uh, socialism is used to take, the, take from one person who has and give to someone else, regardless of fairness, regardless whether they, did, they earn it or whatever. That is not the same thing as the Christian love that we're talking about today. These people saw someone in need and of their, own, of their own choice, of their own free will, convicted to give. Okay? Um, that's not the same thing as socialism. Socialism rewards those who, who do not put forth an effort and restricts those that do. This leads to inaction in society as a whole. If you don't have to do anything, the more you do, the less you get. The more you do, the less you, the more you have to have to do. You know, politicians use this form to try to get votes so that they can get there. But clearly, not the lovely, not the loving God. I mean, clearly, the godly love of brethren that is spoken of here is not one made by mankind. It is not socialism. We know communism is not anything to do with that at all. Neither of these presented here in this passage. Because we see that socialist and communist countries, you know, the mega wealth and the extremely poor. So how can you have the mega wealth in this total socialistic society? You only can because people aren't doing what they say they're doing. You know, they don't preach what practice what they preach. You know, people will say, well, maybe in the uh, even in our capitalist society, this was true today too. Well, you're right. See, any form of government is going to fail. Any form of whether it's socialism or communism or Marxism or capitalism, it doesn't matter because men are sinners and men love money better than they love people. They love possessions more than they love caring for others. And because of that, you're going to never have a perfect system of government in this lifetime. Jesus will come back and establish a true government and it says all the, the things will be upon his shoulders. Guess what? That's a theocracy. 
<laughs> okay, that's not a democracy. That's a theocracy where Jesus is in charge and we have the king. That's the only true government that will be that will survive. Anyway, verse 33 and 34 says, And with great power gave the apostles witnesses of the witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was any among them that lacked. He said, with great power. Here we see the testimonies of the apostles. They were working great miracles. And these miracles, the sole purpose of these miracles was to support the fact that Jesus had raised, risen from the dead. They were showing the power of God, that God can raise people from the dead. See, it wasn't just the story of Jesus' resurrection, but it was the power that went behind the resurrection. Because, see, because Jesus is resurrected, because he said, I lay down my life, and if I lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. See, Jesus had that power, and he demonstrates his power through these apostles. They were healing the sick. They were doing great miracles. Because of the power that is in Jesus Christ, not the power that was in them themselves. The resurrection is what was always what has always made Christianity stand out among all the false religions. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen through eighteen said, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so they also sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. By the way, this is a great passage of scripture that was one of the favorite pastors of one of my mentors, Dr. Floyd Cherry. Dr. Floyd Cherry said he used this pastor passage when his father passed away. He was drawn to this scripture because it says there, it says there, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will ever be with our loved ones. We will ever be with the Lord. This shows you power, folks. And this is the power that, that binds the church today. Is The Christian church today is bound by the power of the resurrected Savior. You understand? Only we have a resurrected Savior. Nowhere else in the world can anybody proclaim that. We have evidence and facts that we have an empty tomb. We have a resurrected Savior. The power that's behind that resurrected Savior is what gives the power to the churches today. And that's what Luke was talking about here. The great power was the Holy Spirit's effect on man's mind, conviction, redemption, rebirth of those who heard and saw these events. See that passage of Scripture? With great power power gave the apostles witnesses of the resurrections. And it says, as a result, great grace was upon them. What is grace? Unmerited favor. God gave them great unmerited favor. Neither there was any among them that lacked, it said. God saved all who asked regardless of their social situation. What a powerful church this was. Verse 34b through 35 says, For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the pieces of things that were sold, the prices of things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribu distribution was made unto every man according as he had needs. These folks were actually selling their possession. This was sacrificial giving. It cost them something. Folks, it cost you something to be a Christian. People that think you can be saved just by, by repeating some words and life is good. That's not what Jesus said. You must count the cost involved. There's a cost. We must give our souls to God. We must give our eternity to God. It's not, it's free. You have the price. Jesus paid the price on the cross for our sins. But we in turn give our lives 
to the cause of Christ. We must sacrifice ourselves. These people here are willing to sacrifice sacrificial giving. Now, by the way, this was voluntarily. They didn't, no one forced them to do it. Just like everything else in your Christian life, no one makes you go to church. You go to church because God calls you to forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. You witness to people not because you have to do it. You know, there's there's the groups out there that are that are like Jehovah Witnesses who say you have to do these things. There's works based salvation. Now, there are a variety of, of false religions that have that. That is not called upon. We don't work, James says. James is my favorite book. James says, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And then he said, faith without works is dead. See, you don't work to get saved, but you work because you're saved. If you don't have any works in your life, there's a problem. These people here gave because they wanted to give. It was not blind obedience of obeying some religious law to earn them good standing in God's sight or among his people. It was the righteous and grateful response of the people to Jesus for having already put them in good standing with God. They did it because of it, not to do it as a result of it. They recognized that, that, that God had died for them and was their, rep, their representative and substitute. He took away their guilt and raise them from the dead, forgiveness and justification of their sins. So they recognized by faith that Jesus had poured out his love and grace lavishly upon them. I mean, he gave his love, he poured out his love. He didn't sprinkle it on you. He baptized you head to toe, you understand. He dunked you in the river Jordan. He brought you up a new creature, washed all over, not just your feet. See, this is a response to his worship and loving Jesus and loving his people and not allowing any of his people who have needs. And notice, genuine needs, while they themselves have plenty. Verse 36, And Josie, who by the apostle were surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted as the son of consolation, a Levi, and of the country of Cyprus. This is a man we know as Barnabas. You know, uh, his nickname was Son of Encouragement. He was an encourager. The things he did encouraged people. People got encouraged by seeing the way he lived his life. Are people Can people call you a son of con consolation, a son of encouragement? Do people, when they're seeing you, do they get excited about Christianity and about being a Christian because of the things they see in your life? This is what happened with Barnabas. Now, this is the same man who helped Saul when Saul first got saved. He was the one who recognized and brought him before the people. This is also the Barnabas that was the co-missionary with Paul in his first missionary journeys. This was the man. Verse 37 said, And having land, this is Barnabas, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, he didn't do this because he wanted fame or glory. He did it because he saw there was a need. He was so moved and changed by the gospel that he was compelled because of the gospel and his love for Jesus. He had a love for the brethren. He was willing to lay down his lives, his possessions, for the brethren. He sold the property that belonged to him, brought the cash to the apostles who were in charge of the group's needs, and gave it to them to distribute. You know, sometimes I hear people saying, I don't like that the church does this, and the church does this with my money. First of all, you got a problem, it ain't your money. My view is I give my money to the church. We give our money to the church. And then it's up to the church. The church is responsible for spending it properly. Not me. It doesn't change what I whether I agree with this project or that project or whatever. That's up to the body. The body votes on it and then they do those things. The deal is it's not my decision to make. My decision is to give to God as God has given to me, right? That's our job. That's our responsibility. And we should do it with a glad heart. Thank Lord I have the ability to give. He was so compelled. He changed his life. He sold his property. allowed them to distribute it. He wasn't asked to do it. He wasn't required to do it. But he gave voluntarily, selfishly, sacrificially. 
to God's church and a grateful response to Jesus. He desired to see the church grow and for others, most urgent needs to be met. He was willing to lay down his life for his friends. You know, is this an accurate description of your giving and tithing? Is your giving to the church selfish, sacrificial, voluntarily? Is it a response to what God has done for you? Do you give because you're grateful for the grace that God has given you? Even if it costs you your worldly comforts? You know what? I could have a place at the beach. I could have all kinds of cars and trucks if I had not given any tithes in my lifetime, if I'm not given to the Lord's work. And I'm not saying that for bragging. I'm simply saying I could see that. I can see how if, he, if I took the money that I give to the church and I used it for selfish purposes, I can have other things, but they're not the things I need. I needed to be in church. I needed to do that. That's why me personally, and I'm not talking about you personally. Me personally, I never, I never, I've thought about buying places, you know, at the beach or at the lake or whatever. I can't do it. Because for me to do that, I would have to be there. To get my money to feel like I earned it, I would have to be there. And that means Saturdays and Sundays. And Sundays is church day for me. Sundays is the day that I'm called to be with God's people, to be worshiping the Lord on that day. Now people say, well, I worship my wife. Yes, you can. But I can't. I'm not talking about you. I'm not bad-mouthing you. If you have those places, great and wonderful. And I'm hoping that you're able to use them to your best intent and be in church when you're supposed to be and do the things you're supposed to do. Because if not, you're using it as an idol. But me, myself, I couldn't do it. So I never had that. I'm glad God did not give me that ability to do that because I need to be, I need personally to be restored, to be recharged on a weekly basis. Um, if you give, do you give because of conviction, because you've been blessed by God, a certain level of personal wealth, unique position to bless others? Do you give out of a sense of tradition? You know, you obey a law, you stay in good standing with God, you remain in good standing with God, people recognize you as an upstanding, faithful, respectable member of the congregation, you know? Do you just think about your tithing? Don't just think about your tithing, but think about everything that you do in the church because money is only one part of your giving. And by the way, it's the easiest part of your giving. Yeah, it is. Whether you're serving as a deacon or a leading a Bible study or attending one or teaching children at church or youth worker, whatever it is that you do as part of your involvement with the church, think about those activities now. Are you asking yourself, what is your motivation for doing this? Are you doing those things as an act of worship, selfish love, uh, selfless love, Sometimes, you know, does that you do it sometimes to give you a sense of importance, satisfaction of being a contributing member for the good? Uh, do you earn recognition and respect? Do you do it to you so you can earn admiration, ad, uh, ad, ad, uh, admiration of your peers? You know, this is the difference between doing something good with gospel inspired motivation and doing good things with selfish motives. You know, your motives for what you give or do is more important in God's eyes than what you give or do. Doing good out of righteousness uh, and graceful response to Jesus and doing good for selfish gains are not parallel. They're in contrast with each other. So one of the examples of a gospel-shaped economy, the other is an example of counterfeit and, and hypocritical economy. Right? One of them is giving from the heart, and what is giving to be seen. So now we're going to go and see. We saw this this first one of Barnabas, and Barnabas is giving. Now we're going to look at Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 1 of chapter 5 says, verse 1 and 2, But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. That word but is a big word in it. But, such a powerful word though, isn't it? You know, it can change hope into destruction, or it can change disaster into hope. For the wages of sin is death, and then what? But, the gift of God is eternal life. So, when we have no hope, but God gives us hope. But is a big word. But here it says, but, it can change. Here, after showing the righteous motivation 
for giving by Barnabas, we now see this ugly side of giving. You know, here Barnabas had done these things and then all these things. This is good. The church gave these things. But there was others in the church. Guess what? We have butts in our church today too. Yeah. <laughs> B-U-T, not B-U-T-T. They may be B-U-T-T's, but that's not what I've been talking about here. We do have butts in the church. We have people that are doing for the wrong reasons. Just like Bar, just like uh, just like Ananias and Sapphira, because they were doing great, great things, and he says, "But um, we see it's not what you give, but why you give that matters to God." Probably among the Christians, uh, there was a kind of a holy rivalry sprung up. You know, everyone was eager uh, to place his means at the disposal of the apostles. Hey, uh, Paul, you see what? Did you see what Barnabas did? I'm not going to be Barnabas. Hey, because of Barnabas, he called the son of encouragement. He got high honor and praise and everything. And people think great of him. I want them to think of me that way. I want to be thought that way. So I want to go and do the same thing. I'm gonna, and so some wanted to be seen as equal to Barnabas. Now note, he had gained glory and respect for his actions, but he never asked for that. There's nothing wrong, by the way, with giving honor and glory to people who are doing right things with God. We honor our pastor, our youth pastor, our deacons, our Sunday school teachers. We honor them, sure, because they sacrifice to do their service. It took me five hours to prepare for this lesson today. That's not about bragging. It's simply saying I'm slow, so it took me five hours. But the point is, the point is, we need to honor those people, not because they want honor, but because they deserve it. Because God gave them the opportunity. And then in turn, they honor God because God gave us the opportunity. This medium, I'm thankful this medium God has given me. Some desire to gain honor, although either not having the ability to give everything, but wanting to be seen as giving everything, or not desiring to give everything. You understand? Some might have wanted to, but could not afford to. And some could have, but chose not to. But they wanted to be seen as others as having done the same thing that Barnabas had done. Luke had given us an example of Barnabas, the encourager. So Ananias and his wife, full knowledge and agreement, does what appears to be the same thing that Barnabas did. Just like Barnabas, he sells a piece of property, Ananias does, and brings the proceeds of the sale to the apostles. I'm going to do just like Barnabas did. I'm going to take it. And the exception was that he kept back some of it. And only gave a portion. Now, why did he do that? Did he do it because he was greedy? Did he do it because he couldn't afford it? It appears that he did it because of greed. Because, as we know, it says that, that the second, the next verse, we'll see that it says why. Verse 3, 5 and 8 says, And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? See, so we see that this was a deception by Satan to try to discredit the church. So we believe that perhaps he had the money, he could have afforded to do it, but he chose not to do it. While it remained, he said, Peter said to him, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. See, Ananias sells his property, brings his proceeds to the apostle, and still he's reprimanded Peter. So what's the difference? It's because Ananias didn't give all the money to the church, but kept back some of it. You know, is that why? Because he didn't give all of it? Is that why he got killed? Of course not. As Peter said, he could. He, Peter said, why it remained, was it not thine own? And after he sold it, was not thine own power? See, it was already his, so Why? Peter makes it clear to Ananias that he was not put under any obligation by the apostles or the church to sell his property at all. It was his to do with as he saw fit. Peter also makes it clear that even after selling his property, the proceeds were still his, and he could still do whatever he wanted to do with it. He was under no obligation to give 100%, 50%, 10% of it. The, the church didn't ask him to give anything. It was entirely up to him. So then why did Ananias, why was Ananias reprimanded by Peter and struck dead by God? Because he said, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? It was this, this was the sin that cost him his life. 
It wasn't about giving. It was about the sin. He allowed Satan to control him. He was not filled with the Spirit of God, but with the Spirit of Satan. He was sent by Satan to disrupt and destroy the church. We have people in our churches today who are there, who are the butts in our churches, that are there to destroy. They're filled with Satan to destroy the church. You understand that? We know that. God tells us this. It, the early church is no different than the day. We got people that'll do the same thing. And I warn you folks, if you allow Satan to control you, to be disruptive in the church, to cause problems in the church, God can strike you dead just like he did Barnabas. I mean, just like he did Ananias and Sapphira. John 8, 48, 44 said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he spake a lie, he speaketh of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. See, Ananias' problem was that he was not a child of God but a child of Satan and was doing these things to be deceiving of the church. In verse 5, he said, And great fear came all of them that heard these things. All of them that heard these things. These were the people that were outside the church. These are folks who would have been the first to disparage the followers. But once they discovered Ananias, and once they discovered Ananias' hypocrisies, they would have been the first to criticize the church. But they were left in awe. The outside people saw that the that that the demonstrated power of God among them and how one cannot deceive God. Verse 6 says, And the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out. You know, these were these were younger, more active members of the church. They weren't officers in the church, they were probably just volunteers to go serve, do whatever they were tasked to do. The day their task was to take this man and bomb him and bury him. You know, church needs folks like that today, not people that take dead people out of church. But, you know, they need people willing to do whatever, the dirty jobs, because surely this was a dirty job. And it was not uncommon, by the way, to bury people the same day that they died because you want to bury them for sunset. And so probably, and probably the apostles commanded this to be done because he already knew that Sapphira was coming next. Because the Holy Spirit, he clearly already knew those things. So we see verse 7. And it was about the space of three hours afterwards when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Now, to me, that's kind of surprising. Three hours later. So where was she? Out shopping? I don't know. But, but evidently, she wasn't anywhere near around town because the people in the town knew about this. So where she was at, I don't know. She might have gone off to, she may have gone to Raleigh to, to shop. I don't know. You know uh, I don't know where she was. But when she comes back, she hadn't heard anything about it, which seems kind of strange to me. But this had to be God doing the test for her. God put her away so she wouldn't hear about this. So when she came back, that she could get the word. And Peter answer, answered her and said, tell me whether you sold the land for such. So Peter tells her the price that, that Ananias had given and she said, yes, she had. Now, he gives her exact demands, and she said, yes. By the way, that immediately sealed her fate. She showed that it was not only a lie that her husband had done, but a conspiracy that they had conspired, premeditated. This wasn't a slip into sin. This was a predetermined. You know, that's dangerous, folks. Do you predetermine your sins? There's a difference between slipping into a sin as a Christian and going out and deliberately planning that sin. Verse 9 says, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Why would you do something so foolish to think that you could deceive the Holy Spirit? Do they think they can escape detection from the all-knowing God whose supernatural presence is with the apostle? Remember David said that when I ascend to the highest heaven, thou art there, and if I descend to the lowest hell, thou art there. <laughs> you can't hide from God. You know, do we try to hide things from God the outwardly that we do? I always say this, God sees you when you're naked. When you got nothing, when you got no makeup, you got no clothes, you nothing. He sees every wart, every scar. God sees everything. You can't hide from God. We better make our actions live up to our heart's meaning. Verse 9 and 10. Behold the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth and buried her by her husband. You know, what else can we say? Peter proclaimed the same judgment for the same crime. She fell in the same spot her husband did. She was taken out just like her husband. She was buried just like her husband. She was put into the same grave with her husband. Verse 11 says, And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. 
This was a reason for the church to follow, a lesson for the church to follow. Those within understood the importance of free will giving and the responsibility of being truthful and giving for the right reason. It was a lesson for the world. God does not tolerate sin in the church. Therefore, he will not accept it from those outside the church either. Conclusion today. What is your motivation for giving what you give and doing what you do? Do you give to the church out of a motivation to glory and praise God and see his church grow? You know, do you do, you do it a motivation to glorify and praise God? Would you continue to give even more of your resources and energy to the church if nobody ever knew that you gave it? Would you stop if the recognition stopped? If all the plaques with your names were taken off the wall and your name taken off the bulletin and nobody ever mentioned you, if nobody took the time to thank you personally and publicly for your efforts and dedication, now let me tell you, there's nothing wrong at all with thanking people for their contributions to the church. It is, it, it, is it, the, the question is, is it their motivation? It's why they did it. That's important. Barnabas gave out a desire to serve God and to honor Jesus and see the church grow so that more people could be equipped to be witnesses of Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira gave out of the desire to receive honor and praise for themselves. Their sin was idolatry and lying about their motivations. Peter made it clear that by lying to God's people, you're lying to God. We give, we do, we witness because Jesus gave his life for our sins. To be washed away and was raised to justify us and make us right with God. We do what we do today because of what God did for us. We can live today the way God has us live because God died for us so that we could live forever with Him. I thank you for your time and your attention. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have that we can come and we can worship you and study your word. Thank you for this word, Lord. Thank you for the power in this word. We pray, Lord, right now that you would bless it so that we might be motivated to do the right thing for the right reasons and to be willing to lay down our lives, our possession, our things for the brethren. Because that's your calling to us today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And may God bless you today.